I, I will say this, there's always room for pharmaceutical intervention under the right circumstances. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, the right circumstances are very, very small. Right. Right. The small opportunity that they would actually need the thing that the doctor described. And I remember working in this insurance company and seeing the not only the claims come through medications and people at my age at the time, my early twenties on four meds. Yeah. I'm like what unnecessary. Yeah. And then you get into these studies around food and it's like they are sponsored. You go down the chain long mm -hmm. enough and look, this is not conspiracy. No. So let's be very clear the the writing is on the wall. At the end of the day, people in this country, one pharmaceutical company, corporation, they want you to be sick yeah. because they make money. I saw an advertisement the other day where it was an ad that said if you're already on an SSRI, an antidepressant, but it's still just not working enough for you, here's another pill you can take. And then when it lists off all the side effects of that second pill, it's insane. I'm like, why would you t take the chance to, to fix one thing and then end up with five more problems? And then you got to take five more pills to solve those side effects. It's like, it, it doesn't make any sense at all. And it's sad that they've already admitted that antidepressants don't work. And the whole thing is that it, if, if the solution to depression is to have higher levels of serotonin, you would think that the solution to the pill would be to raise serotonin levels but they don't. They just take what little serotonin you have and they spread it out. So why not look for a solution that helps add serotonin into your bucket? And that solution is diet and vitamins and supplementation, the right raw materials. And it's so, and it sounds too simple. And a lot of times, you know, I get a lot of on social media because they're like, she, I, by the way, for all of America to know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical expert. I'm also not a doctor, but Right. Let's just throw that out there because they're going to be like, she's not a doctor. She doesn't know what she's talking about. And listen, if, you know, digging deep, deep, deep into the science, you're right. I don't understand that piece, but I understand what happened to me. And I know that depression. Here's another example. This just happened two weeks ago. As now that we're, you know, getting a little bit more recognized and especially Gary is, you know, being noticed for his knowledge in this wellness space. A lot of people send us stuff because they want us to try it out. They want us to promote it. They want to be a part of 10X Health, which is amazing. So he tests the crap out of everything. So we, we turn into guinea pigs, basically. <laughs> so this product arrives. He puts it in a cup. He throws the water in it. And he's like, try it. I should know better. And he should know better, too, to have read the, the ingredients and make sure. But I'm kind of in this like naive assumption that if you're going to bring 10X Health something, you've heard at least somewhere that we say, do not take folic acid, do not take cyanocobalamin. Those are like, if I can just get two words in everybody's head of things to avoid, those are the two ingredients. And, and, and quickly, it's on the back of the label. It's on the back of the label. It's in everything. It's in everything. It's in... It's disgusting. And this is how corporations are killing us. And so they send this product. And the funny thing is they put a good B12. I think they put in hydroxycobalamin, which is like a very expensive form of B12. Usually if you're going to see a good form in natural form, it's methylcobalamin. Hydroxy is much more expensive and harder to source. So it was weird that it was like a really good B12, but then they still cheaped out on the folate and they put folic acid. I didn't pay attention. I drank the stupid drink. And as soon, then I look at the ingredients and I'm like, oh my God, I just broke all my, my rules, you know, by doing this. I almost made myself go puke because I knew I was going to be affected by it. And Gary was like, you'll be fine. It wasn't that much. And don't worry about it. Da, da, da. So I was like, all right, well, maybe I'll be okay. So I let it go. Next day, couldn't get out of bed. I was so depressed. I was like, I wanted the room dark. I didn't want anybody to talk to me. I didn't answer my phone all day. This is like the middle, middle of the week. It's like a Wednesday. I got a million emails, a million phone calls, a million things to do. I couldn't do any of it. And I, but I, in my mind, at least I knew this is what happened. I had folic acid. I'm depressed now. It's going to be out of my system in 24 hours. I just got to, you know, just sleep this off basically. So I slept, I watched Netflix, you know, I ate salads, grilled chicken, took my vitamins. And the next day I woke up fine. That's how I know that how big of a deal this is. And if I can just explain that to people and have them recognize it in themselves, what did you put in your mouth in the last 24 to 48 hours that is affecting your mental state? It's not just about your stomach hurting when you eat something you can't process. What did you put in your mouth that is affecting you up here? And when you start to look back on it, you'll start to, and you recognize it, then you'll go, man, I didn't realize 
that pizza or that mac and cheese I ate. That's what's making me feel cruddy. And so if everybody paid attention, then, you know, then we'd have a much better world. But yes, they have to list it on the ingredient label. So you got to flip the box around and really pay attention to what's on there. When, when I think about that and the space in which you pay attention, getting inside of your body is cool, yeah. especially if you've been sick. True. You know, and I, I remember, so I ended up getting uh, a few different health issues. I got CEO, I got C. diff, I was hospitalized, like on death's bed. Mm -hmm. And and I just had gotten to where sick was like my norm. Yeah. And it's, and I'm running companies, doing all the things, but I'm suffering every day. Yeah. And and I remember just thinking, because my, here's what I think it is. Like it's, it's almost learned behavior mm -hmm. in some way. My grandmother was always Mom was always, neighbors or everybody's always sick all the time. Mm -hmm. I was like, I guess you're just sick. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't know what it felt like to feel warm. And it wasn't until like, I really got deep to trying to understand my body that it, it started to make sense. You could lay it out on the table and I could, couldn't go, wait a second. If I eat these gummy bears, I die 40 and die seven and yeah. high fructose corn syrup, this nature, I'm not going to feel good. Mm -hmm. And the mouth pleasure that you get out of it, like, it's great. It's like the best dopamine. Yeah. Like, this is the greatest ding, shit. Ding. And then exactly. the next day, I'm like, I can't function. I can't think. I can't get out of bed. And it's like, but we keep torturing ourselves. Yeah. And, and I, I take it back to this. I go, if you walked into a room and every single time you walked in that room, you got punched in the face. <laughs> the first. A very good way to put the it. The first time you walked in, you'd be like, what just happened? I don't want to do that again. And the second time you, well, you're, we're, we're human. Yeah, that's you know, a good point. Okay, at least two times. So the yeah. second time you walk in, you're going to be like, okay, hold on. What's going on? Mm -hmm. You're going to poke your head in. And the third time you're not going to go. Yeah. And, and I wish that people would understand, like, you have to keep going. This yep. Path. So uh, I want to rewind again and go back into this. So you're, you're in this place a few years. You're on this multi you the effects. You're on the impact of it. People want to quit. Yeah. Was it really as simple as stopping that vitamin that changed your life? Or were there other interventions you had to bring into play? Because I think mm -hmm. people were suffering from anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, all things that I've also experienced, obviously. Yeah. We they go, is it really that easy? I know. And I never want to say that, oh, this is just so easy. You stop taking this or you start taking that and oh you'll everything will be happy and glorious. I never ever want to put that out there. But I do, I do believe that getting my protocol right, because it wasn't just about not taking the multivitamin. I started to recognize, okay, I have been having some bad anxiety for a while now. And I just always found a reason to blame it. Again, it was, I'm blaming it on starting a business and not really knowing what I'm doing. I'm, I'm blaming it on working with my spouse who, you know, I love and, and adore, but can drive me crazy. So of course, you know, oh, well now I'm, angry or I'm upset or whatever because of something he did. Well, it wasn't that stuff. It was it was more internal. The things I was getting upset about, because a lot of this this the genetic stuff, it's not just anxiety and depression. There's an anger piece to it. Um, and I realized I would get like so mad about something. And it could be over the things like, you know, somebody the kids left their socks in the middle of the hallway again or didn't do the dishes like I asked them to do. And all of a sudden I'm just biting everybody's heads off. And that wasn't me. I was like, why am I being like this? This is not who I am. And so it did take a lot of like internal, okay, I got to really work on myself. And so that's where I started to go to therapy. But still like, yeah, I can work on all these things. I can do breathing techniques. I can, you know, talk myself into a positive space with affirmations and all of that stuff. But ultimately it was deep inside that I had to correct. And those are all great things, yoga and meditation and all of those things are great things to calm the mind. But ultimately what truly fixed it is getting, giving my body the raw materials it was deficient in. And so when I did this gene test and I, it's, we, we only look at five actionable genes. I don't care what your hair color is, your eye color, if you got detached earlobes. I'm just looking for five actionable genes that tell us, did you get the um, gene mutation from one parent or both? And that will help us determine how deficient you are in certain mater raw materials. So for instance, the MTHFR gene, we call it the gene. <laughs> I have that. You do, huh? Welcome to the club. 
Um, forty-four percent of us in the population, and I think that high, that number is higher. Um, yeah, I think so. But about you know fifty percent of us have this genetic mutation, and for me, I got it from both my parents, so I am severely broken. I'm, Same. I'm you're, you're red too. So we're severely broken. And, and it's not functioning at explain all. Explain what that is. Okay. People don't know. It's a good call. So, so when you have this genetic mutation, it means that you, I guess the easiest way to say is we are allergic to folic acid. So if you take crude oil out of the ground, you can't just stick it right in your gas tank. It has to be refined into gasoline before it can go into the gas tank. And then the car and the engine recognizes that fuel source. It's the same concept with methylation. Methylation is the process by which we take in a raw material and convert it or methylate it into a usable form that our body recognizes. So in the case of B12, you can't just take B12 in and then your body just knows what to do with it and it's, you know, it, and then all of a sudden it's energy. It has to be refined, it has to be methylated into the right form of, of energy that, so your body can use it. So <clears throat> there's a whole lot more sciencey stuff to this. If anybody is scientific, they're going to be like, that. maybe that's a terrible explanation, but for us that aren't scientists it's in, it's english you know it's just simple simple way to explain it and you and i are deficient in vitamin b9 it sounds too simple but we are and um that gene can only function at 100 percent if we have five methylfolate in our system so you can get it through food sources like leafy greens and you know there's like a whole long list of um foods that you can find um, like legumes and nuts and seeds and things like that. You can find that on the report that we produce after somebody gets a gene test. And because I always want to tell people, I'm not trying to sell you our multivitamin. I'm really just saying that, yes, multivitamin is easier to take if it has the right raw ingredients, um, but you can also get it through your diet. So you can get, you just have to take in the right form of folate. So one big thing that I think a lot of women recognize when they hear folic acid is if they've ever been pregnant or trying to get pregnant or whatever, they, the, their gynecologist, OBGYN, is going to tell them take high doses of folic acid because they recognized in, again, this all goes back to the 90s, where they're like, you got to take high doses of folic acid when you're pregnant because it prevents neural tube defects in pregnant women. And so they're like, oh, let's give this to everybody. Let's spray the grain source. And because then everybody's eating bread and pasta and rice and cereal. And that's when Cheerios, you started to see the labels on like Cheerios boxes say, you know, fortified and enriched with all these vitamins and minerals. So they were making it sound like, hey, we're giving even in Pop-Tarts, you know, we're giving this is healthy food for your kids. So everybody starts whacking back all this stuff. And all of a sudden, the, you know, anxiety, depression, ADD, ADHD, everything goes on the rise. And everybody's like, oh, well, now we got to create pills for that. So now we have Adderall and Vyvanse and Ritalin and we're, you know, pumping our kids full of antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds. I was an 80s baby. None of my friends had ADHD. So mm -hmm. I, I know my, who I am. Like, yeah. know thyself is the most important thing in the yeah. journey. Yeah. I know I'm stubborn. Mm -hmm. Like, I know it's like in my bones. And I know that that is my greatest strength and my greatest weakness. Mm. And so one of the things that I've had to do to reconcile that, that moves me forward as opposed to stopping me is just I'm like, I'm like, I don't know anything. Put me in the room. Please let me be the person in the room constantly. Yeah. And that only came through this choice of the willingness. Like, I'm going to go step into the unknown and find out who I am. And that moment that you shared seems like that might have been a part of your journey. Yeah. What prompted that for you? Because I think a lot of people who are listening, they're like, yeah, well, I'm in my 40s and I have a family and I like it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. Right. Which tends to be the thing. Eh, it's not that right. bad. So why am I going to do something? Why do I need to do in the inner work? Um, so I found myself a few years ago, I've had anxiety my whole life, but I didn't know that's what it was. I just thought that like, I'm kind of type A, <laughs> like I'm just a control freak. Um, and what happened over the course of time, I started to recognize how unhealthy and, um, unsustainable it was to wake up every single morning with like a huge ball of dread in my stomach. Mm -hmm. And I started talking about it. I started doing therapy. Um, I went to a psychiatrist and I started the therapist said like what does this anxiety feel like for you and i said i wake up every morning and it's like there's this pit in my stomach and even on a day where there's things i'm really looking forward to where i know like she's going to be a great day there's all these things to look forward to there's this pit there that's like okay but like what if this goes wrong or that goes wrong or what if you don't you know achieve in this way or what if you can't figure that thing out 
And so we spent a lot of time talking about like that knot and what does it take to unravel that knot? And what is what would it be like to not wake up with that in the morning to wake up and be like, oh, I got this. It's fine. Or just to wake up and not have any thoughts about like just to wake up and be like, I'm just going to go brush my teeth and like Mm -hmm. not be emotionally processing from the moment you wake up. Um, And so it was really, I think, knowing that I was waking up with that. I was carrying it with me all day. There were a lot of moments in my day where I would have this internal a uh, sense of overwhelm that felt sometimes um, like I couldn't, like my mind was moving at a pace that I couldn't control, but I was having to like live in reality that moved much slower. And it felt like this huge disconnect for like, I'm trying to keep up with my brain, but I can't. Um, and it just became absolutely exhausting. And there's times when it's still exhausting and I take medication and do therapy and like do all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um But it was really reaching out and being like, my brain is like, it's too much for me right now. And getting the diagnosis of general anxiety disorder and PTSD and it helped tremendously in kind of getting to put some pieces together and recognize and being able to name like, oh, that's what I'm feeling. And that's why I'm feeling it. Okay, now I can like neutralize it and move on. Yeah, the the naming it part is the game changer for me. Yeah. You know, when I really try, because in my in my teens and my 20s, I just assumed I was crazy. Mm. Right. My mother crazy my grandmother crazy my stepfather crazy and i'm not using that word lightly they are Mm -hmm. crazy Mm -hmm. bipolar manic suicidal um narcissistic to a t like textbook right and and i know those are buzzwords people throw around but when i was a kid we just called you crazy yeah yeah. and so i'm living this lifestyle where it's like doing gnarly where i'm doing Mm -hmm. stuff where i'm like this is so insane like i don't even know because this Mm -hmm. thing in my brain is like this is normal Right. Right. The same experience that you're yeah, having. And it is really interesting how you're, could you identify that like it felt normal to you, but like it wasn't a com like everyone else. I'm, I'm the one having the interview right now. Man. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know. Let me take over the interview. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but, but here's my thought on it. Like I, I distinctly remember having this moment, these moments of being out of control and recognizing I was out of control, but right. the chaos felt so good. Okay. Th- this is the thing people don't See, understand. The chaos doesn't feel good to me. Which is actually where it's I was going to lead into. <laughs> with, with anxiety, I think the people, most people, they get stuck in the rumination of the disaster, yes. right? I.e., yes. someone's breaking the house, stealing the kitchen right. table, the, the place is burning down. Right. So most people, they go into hyperactivity to mm-hmm. turn that off. Yeah. Is that what you did? Yes, but all internally. And and also, so like my rumination, I know is not normal compared to the people that I spend time with. And so it's like this rumination that is just quietly happening where I'm like, if anyone's sitting around me right now knew all the things that I was thinking at one time. And so it's that high level or like um, hyper awareness that I know that I'm like taking things in or seeing things, feeling things on a different scale than other people. Um, and Like you were like, I'm going to act on these things and be, it sounds like be big and bold. I was like, I'm just going to internalize this and feel like I'm, there's a lot happening inside, but not process it with anyone or not tell anyone that I'm feeling like it's too much. Um, And that's the exhausting part was like having to carry it, but then look quote unquote, very normal on the outside, look like a, you know, just high achiever, successful person, driven person, ambitious person um, without acknowledging that like there's kind of constant panic in the background. What did not acknowledging it do for you? Because there's something, let, let me ask the question yeah. this way, because there's something about high achievers when we just put it to the side, we go, it's like that meme, everything's on fire and it's like the little cat and he's like, it's fine, mm-hmm. right? Is that what it was for you? I mean. um, A little bit. I think the not acknowledging it piece over time just was, became mentally extremely grueling Mm. um and to the point where like it felt like uh, like if you're going through um so let's say you're going through a divorce and so you tell your friends like oh as it turns out we're separating and people are kind of along the ride with you and they kind of have a sense of what's going on it felt like i had gotten so far down this road of like internal panic and anxiety that there never felt like it was the right time to like let someone in because the train was like kind of already so off the rails to be like, hey, so by the way, I just wanted to let you know for like, you know, 30 some years, I've had really bad anxiety and it's become really crippling. Like it just never felt like there was a window to bring people in. So it felt increasingly isolating, I think. And it also felt started to feel really incongruent with like who I was and the work that I was doing where 
like the stuff I talk about on the podcast around like, just nurture yourself and show up for yourself. And like kind of all, all these things started to feel like platitudes if, well, I'm doing those things and, you know, encouraging people to live big, bold, brave lives. I'm doing it in a constant state of panic in the background. Mm. But that's your norm. It's totally my Th- norm. This is the thing that people don't <clears throat> always process. It's yeah. like, that is what you know. Yeah. And yeah. the and the unknown of that is arguably more scary than the known. Y- yeah. Can I tell you what my therapist told me to do that made me so mad? Yeah, of course. There's two things. So the first thing she told me my, on our first session, she's like, I, when you're feeling panicky or when you're feeling a lot of anxiety, she's like, I just want you to do some mindfulness activities. And before she even finished saying mindfulness activities, I was like rolling my eyes like, oh, my God, I'm not doing mindfulness activities. And then she told me the first activity. <laughs> and again, because I'm like, I work in this space. I don't need mindfulness activities. Yeah. The first, I'm not here for you to tell me what to do. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, I actually could give you some tips. How about that? So she was like, next time you're feeling anxiety, I just want you to look around and notice what you see. Notice what you smell. Go through all your senses. Notice all the things around you and identify like, I am safe. I can see this. I can mm. touch this. I can smell this, all this. And I was like, yeah, that's ridiculous. So I was like mad about that because I was like, that's not an actual tool. And then the next session, she told me that in the morning, she's like, I think that it would really help you if you spent like 30 minutes first thing in the morning just sitting down with your tea or coffee and just sitting in silence and thinking. And I was like, oh my God, do not tell an anxious person to just sit there and do nothing. Like I could, that just sent me into like a state of terror. So I was like, okay, I will give you two minutes. I will spend two minutes max. I'm not going to sit down. I'm going to stand in my kitchen, look out my window, take like three sips of coffee and like three deep breaths and call it good. And so that's what I started doing and it worked. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I was like, this that. mindfulness stuff works. So yeah, I mean, it's, um, it has been an interesting process of learning how my brain works differently and like learning some of the tools that I thought were super eye roll kind of tools that do help a bit. Um, but also being super resistant and thinking that a lot of the kind of the stuff that should work for an anxious brain would actually work for my anxious brain. So I, I resonate that that's not a poke at you, but just like, I often think to myself, you should go achieve, you should go and see what you're capable of doing. And, and there is the, the hesitation that I think a lot of people have in, in stepping into that thing about their dreams. You have three degrees. You've competed in so many different events, races, half marathons, bodybuilding, mm-hmm. like all the, like, how is it that you have been able in consideration of your past, mm-hmm. knowing that for most people, it's a massive hindrance, right? My father was like this. My, my mother was like this. I witnessed these relationships. I was in this place. I didn't want to be. I'm sure there was other things involved in that. Like, where does it come from within you to be like, I'm going to go for it. You know, there's certain aspects of my life where I've, I've had a lot more self-confidence than others. One of the things I didn't mention in my 20s is I didn't date at all. I didn't have enough self-confidence to ask a, a woman out to date. No dates. I mean, one or two, maybe. Yeah. I can't remember if they were. That's shocking to me sitting across from you right now. When, and, I, and, I, and I ended up getting married to the very first girlfriend that I had in my, in my 30s. Right. We got, and we were married for 15 years and it was a, um, a functional marriage, but I also knew in that experience, and I know I've kind of go off, gone off on a no, no, you're fine. <laughs> path here that I was, I wasn't growing enough. I, 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 there was more growing for me to do. And this was again, that voice in my head, mm. right? Like in the car with the state trooper and it, that one. That one I didn't act on initially. It, w- it was like, this is the first person who I think's ever really cared about me. And so I agonized over, you know, getting divorced. And, uh, and I, and, and when I finally got the, you know, the courage to, uh, to, to have that conversation, whether she's, yeah, she's like, yeah, where do I sign? <laughs> she's like, I guess she had some growing to do too. This was more about me. And I know I was still a very selfish person in that relationship. Right. So I, I, I definitely acknowledge that, but to come back to your, um, to your thought, when I'm moving my stuff out, I'm going through all of the boxes of old stuff and whatever. And I came across some pictures of me in my twenties and I, and I look and I go, 
this was all in my head. I was a decent, I mean, I'm 5'4", that didn't change, but um, th- there's plenty of people my, my height who've done great things, right? That's, that's not a, a limitation. So I realized that was one of the moments that I realized that this has just been me holding me back, mm. right? As opposed to something else. I got two hands, two arms, right? And, 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 and a brain that's good enough to get three degrees. Um, so there's just been aspects of my life where I've had a lot more confidence to say, yeah, I can go do that. My, my parents' only aspiration for me was to go be a computer key punch operator. And I said that. Right. Because I know I'm capable of more than that. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but, you know, to go ask Julie out on a date. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's that's not something I'm happy to do because I'm so afraid of being rejected. Yeah. Right. Which is understandable. I mean, I can only imagine how many times growing up in a household like that you're rejected. And and for me, I, one of the things is I had a, a massive fear of rejection as well. And I curb that by having the willingness to be rejected all the time. (laughs) And and it almost became a game in some sense. And I don't mean just in, in dating or relationships. I mean, I I got a sales job very young Uh where I had to like call people. Right. Yeah. What are you, you never call me again. I'm going to file complaints. I'm going to find you and kill like the craziest I would hear. Mm -hmm. And so like rejection eventually just became second nature. Right. And I, I think that if you want to build confidence, go get rejected a lot and recognize that it's not about you. Part of that, after the divorce, um, I did get involved, right? Again, the teachers began to show up um, and I started taking uh, a variety of different self-improvement, self-help courses. And one of them was a, um, a, a class, a uh, charm class, we could say. And, and it was uh, over in Hollywood, California. And one of our exercises was we were paired up with buddies. It was all guys. And we were paired up with buddies on Hollywood Boulevard and said, we had to go, and I don't remember what the pitch was, but we had to go approach women, right? And, and invite them to something or I don't, you know, the whole thing though was to break out of that shell. Yeah. And it was really amazing for me because I hadn't really experienced this sort of ability to walk up and not be rejected and have you're sure some people are saying like, yeah, I'm just too busy. But a lot of people there were like, yeah, cool. That's, that's cool what you're doing and, and, uh, good for you and that sort of stuff and actually have a positive experience out of it. Right. So being willing to, to test some of those limits and learn that again, these limits are really way, way up here in my head, as opposed to real limits that the universe is so, oh no, Greg can't do that. Yeah. Right. Well, and that's why I pointed to, I felt surprised by what you just said, because here I see this man who stands confidently chin up shoulders back. And I think people will see me and think the same and not understand that for a very, very, very long time, yeah. it was shoulders down, slumped over, no eye contact. Just anyone, please don't look at me. Yeah. I was invisible. Right. And that's, that's the, really the way I thought about myself in high school in particular, right. Is that I'm just, I wasn't picked on or bullied basically, but I wasn't a part of anything, Mm. you know, I was off, if anything, just hanging out with some of the nerd guys. Yeah. But there's something in you that has the willingness to, to go for it, even though perhaps in all areas, and I don't think we all are ultimately confident in all areas. I think that's probably improbable. Right. Right. And so in consideration, I, I look at that and go, okay, well, there's obviously areas where there's lack of confidence. There's areas that are fully confident. And I, Mm -hmm. I think that perhaps your, 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 your ability to be astute in the things that challenge you mentally have driven you into success. And that's, I'm going to guess the same way that you were able to now reset your life again in your forties and say, I'm actually going to go this direction about health, which is kind of the thing that leads us to today. What was happening in that window where you're like, I'm going to just go in this other path, potentially head into this PhD program, learn about health, ultimately find out like, actually, that's not the thing I want to go into because that's sick care, not health care. Right. What was happening in that window? Well, again, I hadn't chosen, um, an, a a destination. I was running away from stuff all these years. And I realized that health and fitness was a good destination for me that I could be an influencer or, 
even a disruptor, right? To show what is possible at 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80, right? Because I've got some serious goals of what I want to do when I'm 80, mm. right? Um, so there was another event that comes to mind uh, in, in my, yeah, I guess it would have been my 40s where after I was diagnosed with low bone density, I started weightlifting. I was also prescribed testosterone and that helped. And it also improved my libido, which is like, oh, this is what it's like. Mm. Um, I was in the gym. Actually, this was in Germany. I was at work and one of my coworkers said, hey, Greg, have you ever thought about competing on stage as a bodybuilder? Like, who's, he, who's this guy talking to? <laughs> right. And, 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 uh, and he said, no, no, no. I mean, you know, and, and he saw, you know, he, he saw the package, right. Of, of what I was. So he was being really kind and generous. And, and I thought about that a little bit more and, and I guess I said, why not? Right. Why not me? Um, and I ended up, uh, going and competing in a bodybuilding show without ever having been in one. Right. And that takes a little, because I'm like, what the hell am I supposed to do? Right. And, and I met my first coach there at that show though, backstage. She's like, all right, there's, there's some things we need to teach you. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. I'm, I'm a rookie here. Right. So I guess I've been open to coaching right along the way as well. Open to feedback is sometimes it sucks, right? Mm. Getting candid feedback, but honestly, that's the best way forward is if someone is willing to give you honest feedback, they're your friend right? Regardless of what their situation is, they've done you a big favor, um, by giving you some honest feedback and I haven't liked it at times. Um, but I've been at least, I think, willing to listen to it, consider it and also consider and look at, at what other people have done. I think, you know, I did read some of Tony Robbins stuff back in 1990 when he, when he released, uh, unleashed the, uh, the giant to within, I didn't act on it as well as I should have, obviously. But some of those ideas stuck with me, right? That, you know, if you want to get good at something, look at someone who's doing it and yeah. go do what they do. And I've, do, I've done that in some aspects of my life fairly well and others not, not so much, right? But I feel like I've got the, um, the ability to do what anyone else can do. I would like for you and in, in your own interpretation of this, because I, I have mine. And as you're talking, I'm thinking about this a lot. We live in probably the most addicted time in history, right? Which is weird because on, on the flip side of that coin, we also simultaneously live in the safest time in history. And it's almost like the, the, the space for people to step into discomfort since it doesn't exist in our normal day-to-day -day lives has made comfort the priority. And so now you have people addicted to TikTok and social media, porn, online dating, alcohol, drugs, all of these things. When, when you think about and knowing that you've helped intervene in the, the lives of more people than I can even begin to count, what is it that people need to understand about society and the world that we're living in right now when it comes to addiction? All right. So every, every product that's created, um, is, has a, that they study the neuroscience of it. So the reason the book's called a dose of positivity is dose stands for dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins, the four brain chemicals that we're all searching for. We're all searching for a dose, mm. right? So dopamine, the reward system, any, any video game company from the beginning. Um, I mean, Steve Jobs said he never gave his kids an iPad or an iPhone. They know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They want you to seek reward, but there's no end to the reward because it's seeking. Mm. You're always searching for gold, but you're never going to get the gold. Right? So the only way to get over any kind of addiction, okay? Because what is addiction? It is trying to feed something, something lacking. Because what's the human experience? Avoid pain, gain pleasure. So we're always looking for a dose, right? We're either chasing the carrot or avoiding the stick. So I tell people the most important thing is not your want, it's your needs. So someone's like, I, I work with someone, right? And they're massively in debt. And I'm like, well, why do you have a BMW? They're like, why? Well, I, I need a BMW. I'm like, no, 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 you need transport. You don't need a BMW. 
right? So if you can simplify your life to the purpose, not passion, purpose, figure out what you're good at, right? Your skills. Work very, 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 very hard to, like we talked about before, be so good you can't be ignored with that skill set. Use those skills in a purpose-driven way to bring value to someone else, right? Because if I can bring you value, you will pay me. Because people always say they don't have enough time, money, and resources. Well, I can have money if I bring you value because you'll pay me for the service, right? Lose the comparison syndrome, right? Stay in your own lane because if you're driving down the highway in everyone else's lane, you have an accident in life. So stay on your path in your lane. Have a clear focus of what you want, right? Because you've got to you got to know what you got, what you're striving for. Know where you came from. Know where you are. Know where you want to go, right? And like I say, successful people have the ability to do the work, no matter how they feel. An unsuccessful pe- person is always looking to feel good, feel right in the right time. It don't exist. They've only got. In reality, it's me and you sitting on a podcast. Mm. So you have to understand that everything's a test. And the higher you get up the mountain, less air there is, the more of a test. So it's like crabs in a basket. You've heard that saying, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's, you got to get out of that basket or the, that thing. Get away from the crabs. Get away from the, I call them anchors. An anchor will pull you down. An engine will drive you. We're engines. We want to drive people. We look for their potential. We put air in their tires. We light up their fires. We light up their ideas. An anchor will drown you. So you're all, there's all, there, there has to be, because because I don't believe, I think we're in the most addictive time, but then again, is it? Because back then, people were still distracted. Mm. Right? When you look at old clips of people reading newspapers, no one was talking to each other. It's phones, yeah, it's yeah, newspapers. Right? So I think, the, why is it? Think about this. Was it 2,500 years ago, whatever, they they built the Colosseums around there, Roman times, right? Mm-hmm. right whatever the, the, the time was. So if you look at the times back then, nothing is nothing has changed, right? In the sense of a Colosseum could be like a football stadium, a Colosseum, Roman times. You've still got war. You've still got politics. We're talking about what Jesus, what Buddha, what Latzu said, what the Stoics said. It's the same shit. We're just packaging it different. Mm. But have we evolved? Yeah, I we're don't still know. still at war, right? Yeah. Why is there still racism in the world? Yeah, we're still distracted. How could we still, right? Why are we still chasing things? Look, at the end of the day, this is where they don't get it. To addiction technology doesn't mean shit. At the end of the day, Mike, if they put us on our, in front of our graves, right, to face our creator, and they get the 2,650 billionaires in the world, right, whatever there's 2,600 billionaires, there's no moving van behind us to take our It's us and our creator. We can't negotiate a toothbrush or whatever, right? It doesn't matter. What, what, what was it all for in the end? It's not what I give you. It's what I leave in you. It's how, I, it's, it's how can I make you a better person, one of the things that came to mind as you were saying that is there's almost something in that I'll, I'll give you context. When, when I started this journey to be a coach, to mentor, write these books, make this podcast, speak on these stages, it all started because somebody was like, I think you can help me. But Mike, I bat- I was like, I don't want to. I was, and I, and I said, I don't want to because dude, the, journey was so hard. I didn't, I've always thought myself an anomaly to some extent, right? There's always been this punching forward drive that I have, the stubbornness that I pointed to. And I was like, I know I can do this for me, right? I believe that. I believe I can do anything. But when it came to helping this other person, I was like, dude, no way. Absolutely not. Because I knew what it took and it took everything. There is a moniker that I live by. Anyone who's listened to this show for any period of time knows, and I've said it ad nauseum for a reason. Everything in my life summarizes into one thing, no excuses, just results. Yeah. Period. Beautiful. Beautiful. 
And so what I had to realize as I went down this path, decided I made a decision. I will help this person. I didn't even know if I could. I was just like, I don't know, man, let's try it. It's hundred bucks an hour, right? Whatever it was back then, eight years ago. And I was like, but you have to do what I tell you. Cause that's the only thing that I know that works. I didn't know anything else. I couldn't sit here and come up with ideas in real time. I could only track what I had done that was measurable and say, give it a try. And then now it's like, I'm so happy that I made that decision, right? There's so much positivity in the world now because of a choice that I made. And when I was thinking about this book that you've put out, here you are, you don't have to do this, man. You've been on television for Never. You've helped more people than we can count. You have a family, yet here you are being of service, trying to bring positivity into the world. And what had held me back initially was the fear of the failure that I wouldn't be able to do it. Obviously, I recognize that there are people that's going to fail no matter what I do. But talk through this. Let's go in this a little bit deeper because I think it's going to be a really important thing for people to leverage right now. When we are so distracted, we are so avoidant, and maybe we haven't evolved. But the one thing we've always, anybody, you can go back to, to Seneca and the Stoics and even before then Christ and, and look at positivity, look at gratitude, look at joy. Yep. Why do those things matter so much, man? Such a good question. Look, I'll be straight. I, I never wanted to be an interventionist. No way. I just knew I could do it. Because you had done it. I just knew I'm, it's what I'm, I'm called to do it. Mm. See, the calling isn't a conference call. That's why we get distracted. The calling is not what we want to do. It's what the universe, te- we're not in control. We have no control. We think we do. You know, we know we have no control. All we can control is our state, how we choose to think and how we choose to feel. We can't even control our thoughts. We can regulate our emotions because mm-hmm. you see our monkey minds go everywhere, right? We don't control this. That's why when people say, I'm going to make a billion dollars. Great. Can't take it with you. Go and build a castle of lies. You know what? Look at it like this. And I'll get to what you're saying. You go to the ocean and you watch a wave. And you watch the wave. And a wave for a moment of time becomes singular, right? It's a wave. It's it's our wave, Right. And when it hits the shore, however long that wave's life is, what happens? It goes back into the ocean, right? We are spiritual beings of one conscious, believing we're singular waves. Mm. And we have a short period of time, and that shore to us is death, the death of the body. And what happens? We just join consciousness again. I don't want to do the work I do. I can be honest. I want to take the easy route. I have to do it. Yeah. There's a different calling. It's the need, not the want. If I do what I want to do in this human experience, I get girls with big breasts. I get cocaine. I get liquor. I get trouble. I get violence. I get debauchery. That's the truth. If I've had that life, if I could get away with it, I would do it. Yeah. But deep down at my core, I know the right thing to do. So I just have to follow the daily rituals, which is get up early, journal my thoughts, meditate, stretch my body, read something positive, write these books. Do I want to write a book? No. You know how hard it is to sit down and get your thoughts on paper and not write for yourself, write for you? I can admit it. We're all selfish. To be selfless is hard. I don't want to do it but I'm good at it and I do do it. Now, do I love the work? It's work. It's hard. Look, I am blessed to be on the show Intervention. It's a hardcore show where we take people who are going to die if we don't intervene and help them. Do I, would I, do I really want to do that show? Can I do it? Absolutely. Am I good at it? I'm one of the best, right? Not because I'm better than anyone. I'm just really good at what I do. There's a lot of great interventionists out there as good as me. Do I want to do it? If you could offer me a show where I could be a lazy f- and make a bunch of money, of course I want to take the lazy show and be a make a. What, what, I'm not lying. That's just the difference. I just I've got good character now. Mm. 
I've got good values. I know that I know at the end of the day, I've snorted the coke and I've taken the wrong path and I know it's a dead end. That's all. I've been down the dead end street. I just turned yeah. around.